Awesome. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our November meeting of uh, Fairfax County Special Education PTA. Uh, for those who may be new, I am Amanda Campbell. I am the president for this year, and um, we are very grateful to have you all this evening and to be welcoming Rachel Gettler for our presentation here in just a little bit. Um, before we get started, um, first, I would like to apologize to our registrants who registered for language interpretation services for tonight. We had some difficulties. Um, we had intended to provide them, but unfortunately, we will not be able to. Our presenter has agreed to share her slides with us for translation, and we will share with them once we are able to have them translated. We will have inter interpretation services provided by FCPS at the IEP Palooza event on December 3rd, and we're working to have this issue resolved for our virtual general membership meeting on January 31st. Thank you for your patience as we work to improve our language accessibility. And Margaret is going to read this in a translated version as well for this evening. Sí, primero sentimos mucho que no pudimos proveer servicios de interpretación esta noche. Nuestra presentadora accedió a compartir su pre presentación con nosotros para traducirlas y las compartiremos una vez que podamos traducirlas. Sí tendremos servicios de interpretación proporcionadas por FCPS en el evento de IEP Palooza el 3 de diciembre y estamos trabajando para resolver este problema para nuestra próxima reunión el 31 de enero. Gracias por su paciencia mientras trabajamos para integrar la interpretación en nuestras reuniones. Sorry. It's hard to read a statement. <laughs> Gracias, Margaret. Thank you, everybody. Before we begin this evening, we ask for a moment of silence to recognize former SEPTA board member Hillary Press who passed away this morning after fighting two rare cancers. Hillary was a fierce special education mama bear and a counselor for FCPS who worked in fam as a family partnership specialist. Funeral and Shiva arrangements have not yet been shared. She will be dearly missed. Thank you. I am including the agenda in the link in the chat for everyone. You should be able to, to download it directly to your computer. Um, while you are taking a look at that, before I ask for membership approval of the agenda, I'm going to launch our poll. And co-hosts, remember that you won't have access to the poll, but this is just our demographics poll for the evening to get an idea of who we are reaching this evening. Um, if you can take a few moments to take a look at that agenda and fill out this poll, that would be great. While you guys are doing that, I will fill the air with a thank you to everybody who joined us for our SEPTA play date at Laurel Ridge Elementary last month. We had a great afternoon on their accessible playground, and I'm really hoping that we get a chance to do that again sometime in the future. Um, my, I know my daughter, who has mobility impairments, had a much easier time accessing that playground, and it was a great event and a great chance to come out and meet people. So thank you to everybody who came. All right, I see people are starting to fill out the poll. So while that is going on, are there any corrections or additions to the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda stands as approved. Um, one last thing I want to say, um, I do not, sorry, starting again. I believe we might have said this last month, but I cannot remember. This might have been um, after we had our last general membership meeting, but we do want to welcome our new outreach co-chair, Karen Winston. She's an SCPS employee and now joining us, and we're very excited. 
Um, there's a question about the poll and number five is required if you do live in FCPS, does it apply? You should just say that I'm a Virginia resident. Um, well, we will fix that in the future. Apologize for that. I still see results are coming in, so I'm gonna let that go. I'm gonna keep that open for a little bit um, and start with my president report. Um, so since September 20th, we, um, it, what should we answer for number five, Jared? Um, feel free to answer that I live in Virginia, but in another district, I will disregard that question for this event. Um, since the September 20th general membership meeting, we have had meetings with both um, DSS and Dr. Reed. We are now having quarterly meetings with both of them. Um, please take a look, um, keep, keep an eye on our website for um, a more full review of what those meetings entailed. And we have upcoming meetings for them um, in December with both of them as well, which we are very much looking forward to. Um, along the lines of SEPTA collaboration with FCPS, we have also received um, invitations to participate um, in the strategic plan core planning team. Their first meeting is on November 30th. We're still determining who our representative will be, but we will let you guys know. Um, but wanted to let you know that we have been invited to be part of that work. Um, and based on communication with FCCPTA's liaison to FCPS, we are expecting to receive an invitation to the calendar committee as well, which I believe will be starting its work next month. So we will also keep you updated on that. Um, on an FCPS wide issue, you may have heard that there are some proposed changes to the family life curriculum, and there is a feedback um, feedback link available that is open from now until December thirty first or December first. From now until December first, um, and put placing the link in the chat. There are materials to review at that link um, regarding the proposed changes. And also, I would recommend um, subscribing to FCCPTA's emails. Just go to FCCPTA.org and click subscribe in the top right button, in the top right corner, and they will be sending further information out as well regarding these changes. Um, so keep an eye out coming for that. Um, and a work session on those changes was is also on the FCPS YouTube channel on May 24th, uh, 2022. So if you would like some more information, those are some places that you can go to. And the last thing that I have is an invitation, open invitation for everybody to join National PTA on November 17th at 7 p.m. for a virtual, um, a virtual town hall on the launch of the updated national standards. This is part of the grant work that we participated in um, last year. And we are very excited to see what the, um, and results are going to be. So please come and join us that night and we will see what, what they have to say. Rebecca, do you have a quick treasurer's report? Yeah, um, I can share my screen or just sort of walk people through it. Do you have a preference, Amanda? Um, you can share your screen if that's easier. Okay, uh, actually it's disabled. So uh, I can just, um, I can just, go. oh, okay. Now I gotta do that again. Uh, Okay, can people see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, this is our budget sort of where we're at right now. We had a goal. So under the income category, we had a goal of $3,000. We're currently, as of the end of October, about $700 short of that, but we still have memberships coming in. Uh, we have gotten a decent amount of donations. Again, we're still short. Um, only about $300 on that. And those are mostly from our superhero memberships. Uh, we haven't done a lot of fundraising yet. So we still have some efforts to do against that. And then with our grants, um, we've received 750 with another 500 that should be coming. Uh, so all in all, we're around 6,700 short of reaching our projected income at present, um, which doesn't include the funds that we plan to use from the reserve contribution. Um, but we're we're slowly inching towards it, so I think we're doing well. Um, in regards to our expenses, 
We haven't had a ton of expenses yet. Um, spent a little on events and programming, paying for our PT, uh, PTA management software, um, PT board website, uh, insurance and dues, and then also um, Zoom we paid for. And just uh, to let everybody know, we are anticipating an additional $200 to the Zoom line item. As you can see, we've already exceeded it by about $50. Um, it's within our bylaws to be able to exceed the budget, so we're not going to amend it at this time, um, but we're, we're spending that additional money to get translation within Zoom. So we think that's something that is needed and worth those funds. Um, we do expect to spend more in the coming months with mini grants and some other anticipated costs, but at present, our income is more than our expenses. Um, and our bank account stands, as you can see, around $13,000. When we take out pending checks, it's more around $12,612. Um, and I think that's it, unless there's any questions. Does anybody have any questions for Rebecca? Seeing none, we will move on. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for that explanation and update. Um, I, we're, let's start with, do we have Stephanie? Is Stephanie here? No, it's leading the participant list. I'm here. Oh, hi, Stephanie. Can Hello. you give your brief update on reflections? I can. The um, Fairfax County Council PTA's deadline was today, and we received four submissions, and luckily they all worked out, so we were able to submit all four, given the grade levels and the different types of submissions. So those were sent to FCC PTA, and we're hoping some of our participants will go further on through the state and national PTA. So thanks to everybody who sent those in. Awesome. That is so exciting. We haven't had reflections in a couple of years. So thank you, Stephanie, for taking the lead on this and making sure that we got this off the ground. Um, I am going to skip ahead in the agenda to, because I am looking for Lenora's report. Um, my apologies. Advocacy, did you need a few minutes this evening? I think. I can even do it in one minute. Okay. You want me to just go ahead? Go ahead. All right, thanks. Um, just to give everybody a very quick update, um, we did put out a survey earlier this fall. It is still open, and I will try to get the links and throw them into the chat. We have two. One is for parents, and one is for um, FCPS staff. Um, and we actually took the 65 responses that we got from FCPS staff and shared that information with Dr. Reed in our meeting that we had with her earlier. Um, actually, excuse me, we had shared the um, parent responses too. Sorry, my brain is on staff right now. Also today, we attended the uh, school board work session, which was the follow-up work session to the results of the AIR study, which was the um, special education comprehensive two-year audit review. And um, at this meeting, the goal was to be deciding how the AIR, which is an outside um, consulting agency, how they were going to be spending um, a couple months of pro bono hours to be supporting FCPS. And after three and a half hours, I don't think they came to a resolution on that. So feel free to tune in and watch the recording that I'm sure FCPS will post online. And um, we have sent in our thoughts on what would be the best way for them to um, get that support, but stay tuned. That's, yeah, Michelle, that's what, that's what I was going to add is that we did as um, the advocacy committee um, on behalf of the board, we did actually send um, Michelle and I feedback to the uh, school board. So they did receive that from SEPTA uh, yesterday, a day in advance. And also we encourage the everyone to look at that um, AIR report. If you have an interest in a long report, it is a long one, but there's some interesting stuff in there. So if you have feedback for us, uh, we would be happy to have it and take that into consideration as well. You can email us at advocacy at fairfaxcountysepta.org. Or, or, yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, and one last thing, actually, from the steering committee meeting uh, today, or excuse me, from the work session today, Dr. Boyd, who's the head of special services, 
also known as special ed, um, proposed setting up a steering committee for special education planning. And I was actually very delighted to see that on her plan, she has designated a seat for SEPTA. So, yay. Yes, very exciting that we are being invited to the table to be part of the discussions. Thank you, Diane and Michelle. And in the agenda, there is a link to that work session from today. Um, so you don't have to go searching through YouTube for it. Um, and you can find the AAR report on our website if you go into our blog. There is a special education audit update um, link in there where you can download the full report. Moving on for this evening. And this is when I know I have way too many tabs open. Is Allie here? Allie, are you ready to give a quick update for ACSD? Sure. I'll just, yeah. and I'll try and make it <laughs> quicker than I know. Well, okay. Um, hi, I'm Allie Baldessari. I fill SEPTA's representative seat on the ACSD, which is the Advisory Committee for Students with Disabilities, a state mandated, um, one of the 10 advisory committees, but that state mandated Virginia requires all school divisions to have the committee to re review policies and procedures for the provisions of special education. Um, you can find us by Googling FCPS ACSD, and we're also on Facebook if you want more information on the ACSD. Um, we, our committee currently has, has 34 seats, five of which are vacant, and also on our website is an interest form if you want to serve on the ACSD. Um, at our last meeting on November 9th, um, we approved a letter um, sent to the Department of Special Education regarding our recommendations to some proposed changes on IEPs. Um, we have a very active committee this year, and we tend to be sending lots of reports in the moment. Um, at, uh, we have a rather full committee um, and uh, some very active um, subcommittees and lots of exciting new subcommittee co-chairs that have been very busy. Our next meeting is December 14th. If you'd like to make public comment, you can find more info on how to submit public comment on our webpage. Public comment is very important to um, advise the committee on the unmet needs of students with disabilities. The deadline, uh, you can come and give it in person, no need to sign up in advance, but you can also submit um, written or video audio testimony in advance. You just need to remember that it would be sent to the address on the webpage by 5 p.m. the night before. So that would be Tuesday, December 13th. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Allie. All right. I believe that concludes our business for the evening, unless anybody has any new business for the sake of the order. Seeing none, we shall move on to our presenter for the evening. We would like to welcome Rachel Gettler. She is a, an attorney with the Program Legal Group in the Office of Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Education. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Sure. Hi. Okay, I'm going to try to make my technology work. Let's see if it does. Well, as you can tell, we've got our own issues. So we are completely understanding and patient. Okay. Is it? Can you guys see my, hold on. Yes, I can see it. You can see it. Okay. I see it as the, um, right, as the but PowerPoint screen. Yes. Hold on. Okay. Let's see. Okay. That, now yep. you see it the right way, right? Okay. Correct. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Let me make sure I just let me get myself set up here real quick. Okay. Here we go. And hi everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. No, sorry to ahead. interrupt you. I just wanted to clarify, you would like us to ask questions in the chat as we go and hold them until the end, correct? Yeah, it's just easier for me so I can make sure that I get through the slides. I haven't quite done this one before, so I'm not sure about timing. So I just want to make sure I can get through the slides. I'm a fast talker, so I will try to slow down. Um, but yeah, I will answer questions at the end. Just um, in advance, no, there may be some questions that I'm just not able to answer. I can't speak to hypotheticals and things like that, but feel free to ask any questions you have. Absolutely. So um, attendees, please feel free to put this in the, to put any questions in the chat. We will gather them and help facilitate the conversation when we get to the question and answer session. Great. Um, hi, everyone. As Amanda said, I'm Rachel Gettler. I'm an attorney with the Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education. I'm presenting here in my um, personal capacity and not my official capacity. So I'm not officially representing the department. 
Um, I'm here in my personal capacity and I have a son who is a first grader at Silverbrook Elementary School and he has an IEP. So this is an issue near and dear to my heart. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about the bullying and harassment of students with disabilities today. Let me just, sorry, my slides are not, hold on a minute. There we go. So I just, before I get started with the actual presentation and focusing on the bullying and harassment of students with disabilities, sorry, do you guys now see your, let me hide that. Okay. I just want to give you a little bit of background on the Office for Civil Rights. So the mission of the Office for Civil Rights is to ensure equal access to education and to promote educational excellence throughout the nation through vigorous enforcement of civil rights laws. We do this in a number of ways. We do complaint investigations. So anyone who believes there's been a violation of the civil rights laws that are enforced by OCR may file a complaint with OCR, and then we will investigate those allegations to determine whether the civil rights laws have been violated. If they have, we will facilitate a remedy for any violation that's been identified in the investigation. We also undertake compliance reviews. So those are proactive uh, investigations to address civil rights concerns. We evaluate a wide variety of information when we're selecting sites for compliance reviews. And I'm sure you may know, we do have some ongoing compliance reviews and complaint investigations of FCPS at the moment, including related issues related to students with disabilities. We also um, develop and issue policy guidance on the civil rights laws that we enforce. In addition to that, we also do rulemaking. So those are developing and issuing regulations to support the civil rights laws that we enforce. Uh, of note to the attendees here today, we did announce in the last spring that we plan to amend our regulations implementing Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So those amendments that we plan to make are going to focus on advancing equity for addressing persistent barriers to access for students with disabilities in education updating outdated language, and aligning the current regulations with um, the intervening laws protecting the rights of students and persons with disabilities, including the ADA and the ADA Amendments Act. So once the we're working on those proposed amendments at the moment, once those are all ready, they will be issued and published in the Federal Register, and members of the public will have an opportunity to submit comments on those proposed regulations we will review um, and consider all the comments, and then we will submit. We will pub publish a final rule. So that's something that we're working on right now. OCR also provides technical assistance to school officials, parents, students, and others to inform them of their rights and responsibilities under the laws that we enforce. And finally, OCR also collects data through our civil rights civil rights data collection, and that is a mandatory data collection of civil rights data from students in grades pre-K through 12, and it's all school districts across the country participate, are required to submit data through the civil rights data collection. You can look up data for an individual school or school district, that civil rights data collection data at ocrdata.ed.gov. Some of the data available includes data on harassment and bullying disaggregated by the basis on which the harassment or bullying occurred, including disability, and also the characteristics of the student reported to have been bullied or harassed, including uh, IDEA students broken down by male and female genders. So that's something that's available to the public. So Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, those are the two laws related to students with disabilities that OCR enforces. We enforce Section 504 against all entities that receive federal financial assistance from the Department of Education, including all public schools, school districts, and public charter schools and magnet schools. Under Section 504, as you may know, schools best provide students with disabilities equal educational opportunities, and among other things, that means they must ensure that students with disabilities receive uh, FAPE. Title II prohibits disability discrimination by public entities, including public schools and school districts, as well as public schools, magnet schools, regardless of whether they receive federal financial assistance. Now, the IDEA is another key federal law that addresses the needs of students with disabilities. Another office in the Department of Education, the Department of Education's Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, 
not the Office for Civil Rights administers the IDEA, but the Office for Civil Rights does enforce Section 504 and Title II rights of IDEA eligible students. And we work closely with the OSER's office and the Department of Education on IDEA issues. In addition to those laws related to students with disabilities, OCR also enforces Title VI of the Civil Rights Act prohibiting discrimination based on race, color, or national origin, Title IX of the Education Amendments prohibiting discrimination based on sex, the Age Discrimination Act, and the Boy Scouts of America Equal Access Act, which prohibits the denial of equal access to public school facilities, to the Boy Scouts of America and other certain youth groups. But I'm going to focus tonight on the laws related to students with disabilities, Section 504 and Title II, as well as IDEA obligations. So just some quick um, background information on harassment and bullying. So as we know, in the last number of years, many schools have adopted anti-bullying policies. And it's important to recognize that some student misconduct that may fall under a school's anti-bullying policy also may trigger uh, responsibilities under one or more of the civil rights statutes enforced by OCR. So the specific label that's used to describe the conduct does not determine whether or not it's discriminatory harassment as prohibited by Section 504 and Title II. Knowing that some of the conduct that while a school district's policy may call it bullying, it still may constitute discriminatory harassment, therefore triggering their obligations under those civil rights laws. Oops. Uh, in order for the conduct to fall under the laws enforced by OCR, it's peer harassment, the general um, standard is that it must be sufficiently serious to rise to the level of a hostile environment, whereas bullying can be something not to despair, not to minimize it, but what we would say is perhaps less severe. It doesn't meet, have to meet those specific standards, doesn't have to be maybe something that doesn't meet, rise to the level of something being sufficiently serious as to deny or limit student participation. So why is harassment and bullying of such concern? Um, obviously, it could violate a person's civil rights. It can deny equal educational opportunities to the harassed person, and it can create a hostile environment that undermines the education of all students. And if unlawful harassment is left unaddressed, a hostile environment which may be created, and that make the school that may make the school environment unsafe for the entire school community and not just harassed persons. So some examples of where harassment or bullying occurs, um, it can happen in any part of a federally funded education program or activity. So a school bus, playground, athletic field, locker room, classrooms, including virtual classrooms in this day and age, that's important. Anything that's part of the definition of program or activity under the civil rights laws is quite broad. So it would also include cafeteria, hallways. Um, if you're going off site as part of a field trip for the school and something occurred there, even though it's not on the school's campus, that would be considered also part of the program or activity of the school, extracurricular activities, something that happens in recess. Um, and, and it could potentially, depending on the factual circumstances, cover bullying or harassment that happens on internet or social networking sites and applications. Those are very fact specific though, given the first amendment. So disability-based harassment, which is gonna be my focus today. So the definition, that OCR uses of disability-based harassment is conduct based on a disability that is sufficiently severe, pervasive, or persistent, persistent, so as to interfere with or limit a student's ability to participate in or benefit from the services, activities, or op opportunities offered by the school. And the shorthand for that is the conduct created a hostile environment. Also just note that disability-based harassment can result in a denial of faith and I'm gonna talk about that more later in the presentation. And again, like I said before, these are the standards that are applicable to whether or not something is disability-based harassment under OCR's laws and may not necessarily be applicable to whether or not something is bullying under the school district's bullying code of conduct. So what are a school's obligations to address disability-based harassment? So bullying of a student on the basis of their disability may result in disability-based harassment violation under Section 504 and Title II. 
when a school knows or should know of bullying conduct based on a student's disability, it must take immediate and appropriate action to investigate or otherwise determine what occurred. And if the investigation reveals that the bullying based on the disability created a hostile environment, then the school is obligated to take prompt and effective steps reasonably calculated to end the bullying, eliminate the hostile environment, prevent it from recurring, and as appropriate, remedy its effects. And I'll get into each one of those individually. So I talked about when the school is on notice of harassment. They have to be on notice. So what does that mean? In this context, it means when the school knows or with the exercise of reasonable care should know of the harassing conduct. And I want to point out that this standard here for notice is the standard that the Office for Civil Rights uses in our administrative enforcement of the civil rights laws. It's some people refer to it as the constructive knowledge standard. It is different than the standard that a court would use if you were suing um, for monetary damages in a court for disability-based harassment. That is a actual knowledge standard. So the school must have actual knowledge, not just know or should have known. So how can a school learn of disability-based harassment? Um, various ways. In some situations, the harassment may be openly practiced, widespread, or well-known to students and staff if it's occurring in, out in the public, in the hallways, or during academic or other classes. And those are the that's those are situations where it's obvious enough to conclude that the school should have known of the hostile environment. Other situations, the school may know of the incidents of misconduct and their exercise of reasonable care should have triggered an investigations that would lead to the discovery of an additional incident. So in certain cases, there may be one isolated incident and we would say schools should have conducted a thorough investigation and had they done so, they would have found out about additional incidences. So they should have been on notice of those cases. Schools can be informed by parents, um, staff, students themselves about an ongoing harassment issue. That's another way that they can get notice. Uh, so these are the, this next slide talks about uh, the various ways. So I, one thing I want to talk about it, flag here is this bullet about a complaint is filed. So every school district is required to have grievance procedures under Title II in Section 504. And those grievance procedures are the school district's procedures for handling complaints of discrimination based on disability and, and other, they also have to have them under Title IX sex discrimination as well, but for disability and those would include, that would include handling uh, disability harassment. So FCPS is required to have those procedures. Some school districts choose to have a separate um, bullying or harassment procedure that's separate from their um, procedures that handle other types of discrimination complaints, and in some cases they combine them. So these are the various ways that a school, other specific ways a school can learn of harassment. So the other standard we talked about is um, the hostile environment standard. So it has to be severe, pervasive, or persistent enough to um, deny or limit the student's ability to participate in the education program or activity. So the determination of hostile environment is based on considering all the circumstances, the totality of the circumstances. And when we're looking at this, we're also considering the conduct from both the subjective, so how did the complainant perceive this, and the objective perspective. How would a reasonable person in the complainant's position perceive this? So under the subjective standard, the conduct must harass the student enough to interfere with their participation in the program or activity. And under the objective standard, we're considering whether the student's reaction is reasonable given the student's age, race, sex, you know, disability, any other relevant factors. Um, we were gonna look at, is the complainant unable to fully participate in or benefit from the school's program or activities? So some examples may include the student's grades go down, the student feels forced to withdraw from an activity or program or um, other school school um, extracurricular or core program or activity. Uh, maybe the student doesn't withdraw and they continue to participate in programs or activities, but they do so with great difficulty. And you don't need to be able to point to a tangible injury. So you don't need to be able to say, 
you know, oh, I have a diagnosis of PTSD based on this conduct or anything like that. It's just looking at everything. It doesn't have to be a concrete cognizable injury. And it is a fact-specific determination. So this slide um, goes through some examples of disability-based harassment. Also, um, on the slide at the end, I have links to uh, OCR guidance related to dis harassment of students with disabilities, and those guidance that goes guidance documents include additional hypothetical examples, and I have some more um, examples on other slides that I'll talk about um, a little later in the presentation. So. One example would be several students continually remark out loud to other students during class that a student with dyslexia is retarded or deaf and dumb, does not belong in the class. As a result, the harassed student has difficulty going, doing work in class and her grades decline. Oops, sorry. Students continually taunt or belittle a student who is immunocompromised for wearing a mask inside and outdoors. The student is intimidated by this conduct, stops participating in class or during recess and other outside activities. A student repeatedly places classroom furniture, or other objects in the path of classmates who use wheelchairs, impeding the classmates' ability to enter the classroom. And finally, we can have employee on student harassment, not just peer harassment. This last example, a teacher repeatedly belittles and criticizes a student with a disability for using accommodations in class, with the result that the student is so discouraged that she has difficulty performing in class and learning. And these, these are examples of fellow students doing the um, harassing as well as an employee. You can also have a situation where there's a third party who is doing the harassing. It could be perhaps a student from another, um, another school or another school district or um, you know, an outside individual who's maybe working as not working, but volunteering in the school or coming to give a presentation to the school. So it, it's, it would cover harassment by fellow students, employees, and third parties. So how does a school, how does the school have to respond to disability-based harassment? So if harassment has occurred, doing nothing is always the wrong response. So, but depending on the circumstances, there may be more than one right way to respond. First, a school must take immediate and appropriate action to investigate or otherwise determine what occurred. If the school finds that the bullying based on disability occurred and created a hostile environment, the school must take prompt and effective steps, reasonably calculated to end the bullying, eliminate the hostile environment, prevent it from occurring, and as appropriate remedy its effects. So when OCR is looking at this situation, we would find that a disability-based harassment violation occurred under Section 504 and Title II when a student is bullied or harassed based on their disability, the bullying was so severe, pervasive, or persistent to create a hostile environment, so to deny or limit their ability to benefit from the school's education program or activity, the school officials knew or reasonably should have known about the conduct, and the school did not respond appropriately. And I'll talk about the FAPE obligations in addition to this on the next slide. So in evaluating what the school's response is, when OCR gets these kind of complaints, we're examining whether the school took timely, reasonable, age-appropriate, and effective action that was reasonably calculated to stop the harassment and prevent its recurrence, while also minimizing any burden on the student who was, who was harassed. Now, schools don't have to know. I mean, we're not asking them to be able to predict the future. So we're talking about reasonably calculated. So were those steps reasonable? If in fact they didn't stop um, the harassment, did the school go back and try other steps or did they just let those steps that they knew, did they just leave in place those steps they knew weren't working? So that's the kind of thing. But we, we understand that schools can't predict the future and know definitively whether or not something is going to work to stop the harassment, but we want them to be reasonably calculated when they're thinking about that, what actions to take. Also looking at like I said, whether the actions they took actually did eliminate the hostile environment, whether they took appropriate interim action while they were investigating the allegations. So making sure that the alleged harasser and the harassed student were not in the same class or taking other steps to keep the parties apart to ensure a safe environment and stop any recurrence of the harassment. Whether the school provided any services, if necessary, to address the effects of the harassment on which the school was responsible. So 
did they maybe provide tutoring to the harassed student to address any diminished academic per performance? Did they provide reimbursement for private counseling that perhaps a harassed student had to seek um, to deal with the, the effects of the harassment? We're also looking at whether the school's policies and internal policies include, like I said, the grievance procedures, whether they include prompt and equitable procedures for handling discrimination and harassment complaints, and whether those procedures were in fact communicated to the students and parents, or whether nobody knew about those and nobody knew how to, um, how to report the incidences. Just one note here, when a student with a disability has engaged in misconduct that is caused by his or her disability, so I'm talking about, in this case, a student who is the harasser, um, the student's own misconduct would not relieve the school of its legal obligation to determine whether that student's civil rights were violated by the bullying conduct of another student. So for example, if a student, for reasons related to his disability, hits another student, and other students then call him crazy on a daily basis, the school should address that conduct of a student with a disability, of course, but the school must also consider whether that student with a disability is being bullied on the basis with a disability under Section 504 in Title II. And again, these obligations that I've talked about and what the school has to do and the hostile environment standard is the standard for a school's response to notice of disability-based harassment that OCR uses in its administrative enforcement. The standard for private lawsuits for monetary damages would be the school has to have actual knowledge and their response has to be not deliberately indifferent, mean, meaning not clearly unreasonable in light of the circumstances. So that is a bit of a higher standard to meet in order to get monetary damages. So the appropriate remedies, this is talking about remedies that um, OCR might obtain um, following a violation finding of harassment on the basis of the disability. The appropriate remedies will vary depending on the facts of the case, but they should always be tailored to redress the specific problems and not every remedy would apply to every um, case, obviously. So appropriate remedy, remedial remedies may include separating the accused harasser and the harassed student. Noting, though, that we should not be penalizing the student who was harassed. Uh, school may also be required to provide services to the student who was harassed in order to address the effects, like I said, um, counseling, academic supports, things like that. School should also monitor the activity or location where the harassment occurred, um, as well as the complainant to ensure the harassment does not resume. So we would assume those are some basic things that they need to meet, and I'll also address, uh, discuss the FAPE obligations that they have to meet as well. So sometimes we're talking about, in, in a case of harassment, whether students with disabilities are, are on another basis, remedies not only for the student who was harassed, but also remedies for the entire school community. So. And that's going to depend on the factual circumstances. So some remedies, if the if it's widespread and it's affected more than just the complainant, the student who was harassed, we may get into um, requiring the school to develop, revise, or publicize their policy prohibiting harassment and discrimination, their grievance procedures for harassment complaints, <laughs> excuse me, ensuring that they're clearly publicizing the contact information for their civil rights coordinators, and by law, in addition to having grievance procedures to handle complaints of disability discrimination, they're also school districts are also required to have uh, identify a Section 504 Title II coordinator and publicize that um, individual's contact information. So at a minimum, a school's responsibilities are going to include making sure that the harassed students and their families also know how to report any subsequent problems, conducting any follow-up inquiries to see if there's been any subsequent new incidences, monitoring for possible instances of retaliation, and responding promptly and appropriately. Other possible remedies, in some cases, OCR has required schools to institute um, climate survey, conducting an anonymous survey of the school climate to determine what kinds of harassment other 
problematic behaviors are present, that's where we have a situation where there's kind of widespread harassment or it's impacting the entire school community. Um, I also have discipline on this slide. I want to just give a um, recognition that we recognize that discipline is not necessarily the best or the only way to address um, harassment of students with disabilities or any kind of harassment. But recognizing that in more severe cases or with repeat offenders, some form of discipline, including progressive discipline, may be necessary. The more severe the harassment, the more comprehensive the response should be. When student misconduct implicates civil rights laws, though, school administrators should look beyond simply disciplining the harassers. So discipline may be necessary, but it's often insufficient to address all the harmful consequences to the school environment. So FAPE considerations, and this is something that kicks in when a student with a disability is bullied on any basis. So it doesn't have to be that they were bullied on their on the basis of their disability. It could be any basis. They could have been bullied or harassed based on sex, race, something that's not even covered under the civil rights laws. So bullied on the basis of socioeconomic status or any kind of bullying. So a school must consider a student's right to a free and appropriate public education under IDEA and Section 504. When a student with a disability is harassed or bullied on any basis, the, the school must ensure that the student still receives FAPE. This includes remedying a past denial of FAPE, and if the student's needs have changed because of the harassment, the school would need to offer additional or different services. So when a student with a disability is receiving IDEA or Section 504 FAPE services, a school's investigation of the bullying or harassment should also include determining whether the student's receipt of appropriate services may have been affected by the bullying. If the investigation reveals that the bullying created a hostile environment and there's reason to believe that the student's IDEA or Section 504 FAPE services may have been affected by the bullying, the school has an obligation to remedy those effects on the student's receipt of FAPE. Even if the school finds that the bullying did not create a hostile environment, the school still has an obligation to address any FAPE-related concerns. Okay, And both OSERS and the Department of Education and OCR have made clear that under both IDEA and Section 504, as part of a school's response to bullying of a student with disability on any basis, the school should convene the IEP team or the Section 504 team to determine whether, as a result of the bullying, the student's needs have changed such that the student is no longer receiving FAPE. The effects of the bullying could include change, adverse changes to the student's academic performance or behavior. And if the school suspects that the student's needs have changed, the IEP team or the Section 504 team must determine the extent to which additional or different services are needed. They must ensure that those changes are made promptly, and they must safeguard against putting the onus on the student with disability to avoid or handling the bullying, to avoid, sorry, to avoid or handle the bullying. In addition, they also have to, if they're considering a change of placement, like perhaps in a situation where they've decided they need to separate the student who was the harasser from the student who was being harassed, they need to ensure that Section 504 um, and any other FAPE services are provided in an educational setting with persons who do not have disabilities to the maximum extent appropriate to the needs of the student with disability. So there's, I talked about, oh, if they think there's a change in academic performance or behavior, they need to convene those, either the 504 or the IEP team. There's no hard and fast rules regarding how much of a change in academic performance or behavior is necessary to trigger that obligation. But a sudden decline in grades, the onset of emotional outbursts, an increase in the frequency or intensity of behavioral interruptions, or a rise in missed classes or sessions of Section 504 services would certainly generally be sufficient. And it's, it's a fact-specific determination, but those are some examples of things that are definitely sufficient. So continuing on the FAPE considerations. When bullying results in a disability-based harassment violations under the laws of, that OCR enforces, it does not necessarily always result in a denial of FAPE. When a student who receives IDA or Section 504 FAPE services has experienced bullying, 
resulting in disability-based harassment, though, there is a strong likelihood that the student was uh, denied FAPE. So it's something that has to be considered, but it's not necessarily always the case. So what we say in OCR is that ultimately, unless it's clear from the school's investigation into the bullying conduct, there was no effect on the student with a disability's receipt of FAPE, the school should, as a best practice, promptly convene the IEP team or the Section 504 team to look into the issue and determine whether and to what extent the student's educational needs have changed and to whether and what extent the bullying impacted the, the student's receipt of FAPE and any additional or different services, if any, that are needed. So I wanna talk about how OCR analyzes complaints involving disability-based harassment of students. So when, when investigating disability-based harassment, OCR considers several factors, including, was a student with a disability bullied or by one or more students based on the student's disability? Did the conduct create a hostile environment? Did the school know or should have known about the conduct? And did the school fail to take prompt and effective steps reasonably calculated to address that conduct? If the answers to each of these questions is yes, then OCR would find a disability-based harassment violation under Section 504. And if the student was receiving IDEA or Section 504 FAPE services, OCR would have a basis for investigating whether there was also denial of FAPE under Section 504. Even if the answer to one or more of these questions is a no, if the student was receiving IDEA or Section 504 FAPE services, OCR may still consider whether the bullying resulted in a denial of FAPE under Section 504 that must be remedied. So that would be an example of one where the bullying conduct did not rise to the level of violating the civil rights laws that OCR enforces, but it did rise to the level of impacting the student's receipt of FAPE, which is also a civil rights violation. So when investigating whether a student receiving IDEA or Section 504 FAPE services who was bullied was denied FAPE, OCR would consider several facts, including did the school know or should have known that the effects of the bullying may have affected the student's receipt of FAPE under either IDEA or Section 504? For example, did the school know or should have known about adverse changing changes in the student's academic performance or behavior, indicating that the student may not be receiving FAPE? If the answer to this is no, then there would not be any FAPE violations. If the answer were yes, OCR would then consider whether the school met its ongoing obligation to ensure FAPE by promptly determining whether the student's educational needs were met, and if not, making changes as necessary to his or her IEP or Section 504 plan. If the school did not do those and the student was not receiving FAPE, then OCR would find that the school violated its obligation to provide FAPE. So I'm going to um, talk now about a few examples to kind of walk through how this might work in practice. So the first example that I'm gonna talk about is a situation where there was, we would find a disability-based harassment violation and also a FAPE violation. So at the start of the school year in this hypothetical example, a 10-year-old student with ADHD and a speech disability is fully participating in the classroom, fully interacting with peers at lunch and recess and regularly attending his speech therapy sessions. The student's Section 504 plan also provides for behavior sp supports that call for his teachers and other staff to supervise him during transition times and provide him with constructive feedback and help him use preventative strategies to anticipate and address problems with peers. Because of the student's disabilities, he makes impulsive remarks, speaks in a high-pitched voice, and has difficulty reading social cues. Three months into the school year, students in his PE class begin to repeatedly taunt him by speaking in a high-pitched tone and setting him up for social embarrassment by directing him to ask other students inappropriate questions. The PE teacher witnesses the taunting, but neither reports the conduct to a school official nor applies the student's 504 behavior support specified in the 504 plan. The student begins to withdraw from interacting with other kids in PE and avoids other students at recess and lunch. He also misses several sessions of speech therapy, and his speech therapist does not report those absences to the Section 504 team or any other school official. 
Here, OCR would find a disability-based harassment violation because the school knew about the bullying, the PE teacher witnessed the conduct, yet upon witnessing the conduct, the teacher failed to provide the student with the behavior supports and also did not report the conduct to another school official. OCR would also find a FAPE violation because when the PE teacher failed to implement the behavior supports on the 504 plan, the school then is considered to have denied the FAPE, the student FAPE under Section 504. In addition, and independent of that, because the bullying impacted the student's receipt of Section 504 FAPE, the school should have addressed the student's changed needs, and by failing to do so, the student was denied FAPE under Section 504. The PE teacher knew about the bullying, did not report the student's behavioral changes to any 504 team members or other appropriate officials. The speech therapist also knew the student was missing speech therapy and did not report that information. By failing to address the effects of the bullying on FAPE, the school did not make necessary changes to ensure the student was provided FAPE. This next hypothetical example is a situation where there would be a FAPE violation, but no disability-based harassment violation. So in this example, a 13-year-old student with depression and PTSD who receives counseling as part of her Section 504 services is often mocked by her peers for being poor and living in a homeless shelter. Having maintained an A average for the first half of the academic year, she's now getting Bs and Cs, neglecting to turn in her work regularly and missing counseling sessions. When asked by her counselor why she's no longer attending sessions, she says she feels nothing is helping and that no one cares about her. The student tells the counselor she no no longer wants to attend counseling sessions and misses the next sessions. The counselor tells the principal that the student missed several counseling sessions and that the student feels the sessions are not helping. At the same time, the student's teachers also inform the principal that she is struggling, that the student is struggling academically. The principal asks the teachers and counselor to keep her apprised if the academic performance worsens, but does not schedule a Section 504 meeting. In this example, whether or not the school knew or should have known about the bullying, OCR would not find a disability-based harassment violation under Section 504 because the bullying incidents were based on the student's socioeconomic status not her disability. However, independent of that, regardless of whether the school official should have known about the bullying, the school district still had an ongoing obligation under Section 504 to ensure the student was receiving FAPE. Here, the student's decline in grades, coupled with changes in her behavior, should have indicated to the school that her needs were not being met. And in this example, OCR would find that these adverse changes were sufficient to put the school on notice of its obligation to promptly convene the Section 504 team to determine the extent of any FAPE-related problems. Finally, this last hypothetical example is a situation where there would be no disability-based harassment violation and no FAPE violation. So in this hypothetical situation, an elementary school student with a peanut allergy has a Section 504 plan. In advance of a Halloween party, the teacher reminds the class that candy with peanuts is prohibited in the classroom at all times, including Halloween. That afternoon, while on the bus, a classmate grabs the student's water bottle out of the student's backpack, drinks from it, and says, I had a peanut butter sandwich for lunch today, and I just finished it. The following day, while having lunch at the peanut-free table in the lunchroom with some friends, a classmate who'd been sitting at another table sneaks up behind the student, waves a candy bar with peanuts in her face and says, time to eat peanuts. The candy bar doesn't touch her, but a few other classmates begin chanting time to eat peanuts and the student leaves the lunchroom crying. Student goes back to her classroom, tells the teacher what happened. The teacher asks her whether she came into contact with the candy bar and what happened with the water bottle. The student says she's scared to go back into the lunchroom and ride the bus. In this case, the teacher promptly informs the principal of the incidents and the peers who taunted the student on the lunch bus and on the bus and in the lunchroom are interviewed by the assistant principal and were required to meet with the counselor. That same week, the school holds a Section 504 meeting to address whether any changes were needed to the student services in light of the bullying. The principal also meets with the school counselor and they decide that a segment on the bullying of students with disabilities, including students with food allergies, will be added to the counselor's presentation at the school's anti-bullying 
assembly scheduled in the next week. In the weeks that fall, the student shows no adverse changes in academic performance or behavior. And when asked by her teacher and the school counseling counselor about how she's doing, she indicates the bullying has stopped. In this situation, unlike um, the first one, once on notice of disability-based harassment, the school officials act quickly to investigate the incidents, address the behavior of the students involved, and ensure there were no residual effects on the student who was harassed, and coordinated to promote greater awareness among students of the school's anti-bullying and harassment policies. The school also promptly um, handled its obligations under Section 504 by uh, determining whether or not, looking into whether or not the student's FAPE was affected and determining that it was not. So by promptly holding a section 504 meeting to assess whether the school should consider any changes to services, the school met its obligation to provide FAPE under section 504. So those are a few hypothetical, hypothetical examples so you can see how these um, cases may play out. Uh, on the next slide, I have some resources uh, of Department of Education guidance documents that may be helpful. Um, this first one in September of 2021, we released a back to school guide, and this is broader than just harassment of students with disabilities. It's uh, supporting educational environments free from discrimination, and it's focused on elementary and secondary school, and it actually covers resources for all the laws that OCR enforces, not just disabilities, and within disabilities, not just as it relates to harassment. Our The last guidance document, most recent guidance document that OCR put out related to students with disabilities and bullying, which is still a good guidance, still in effect, was an October 2014 Dear Colleague letter. And that has some hypothetical examples and some of the same information that I shared with you today. In August of 2013, OSERS put out their own Dear Colleague letter on responsibilities under the IDEA to address bullying of students with disabilities. Again, that's also still good guidance. And in October of 2010, OCR put out a Dear Colleague letter on harassment and bullying under all the civil rights law that OCR enforces, including under the um, civil rights laws that protect students with disabilities. And those are all available on OCR's website. Options for involving OCR. So I talked about how OCR um, does a number of things. And one thing that we do is we do handle complaints. Um, we have an electronic complaint form on our website. Anyone who believes that a student has been harassed based on disability can file a complaint with OCR. You do not have to go through the school's um, process first. Uh, there is a time limit though. You have to file within 180 days of the last act of harassment. Or if you have gone through the uh, school district's grievance process and you were not satisfied with that, you have to file within 60 days of the completion of the school's grievance process. Uh, and just one other note, uh, you cannot, if the same allegations are being investigated either by the school, by perhaps Virginia State um, Civil Rights Office, or um, there's been a complaint filed in court, OCR will not um, will not accept that complaint if the same allegations are being handled by another entity. You can also uh, request technical assistance from OCR by contacting OCR by email phone with questions, concerns, or requests. And I have the contact information on this side, OCR's website. And then for any technical assistance inquiries, it's just OCR at ed.gov. And I will... And this and try to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> and that was a lot of information. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it is complicated. Um, but hopefully, and if you do take a look at the guidance document, sometimes that's easier because they will, they kind of lay out that information in written form, depending on the type of learner you are, that may be easier than hearing it presented orally. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was <laughs> a fantastic presentation. Um, the first question that I'm going to send your way is that I saw that you put in the timelines um, at the in the last slide there, but the way this right. question is worded is slightly different, so okay. I'm not sure if the answer is different. Is what is the statute of limitations for the school to investigate a claim? So that would be up to the school. So OCR does not has not set out under our civil rights laws. There is no. Um, we have not told schools that there's a, um, you know, you have to, you don't have to investigate complaints if they're, if the allegations are more than X days old. 
but schools on their own can set their own statute of limitations. So you would have to look at FCPS's grievance procedures for handling complaints of disability harassment. In certain cases, you know, if a complaint, if you think those are, whoa, these are pretty quick, they say five days or something that seems unnecessarily short. Sometimes that has come up in OCR complaints when we're evaluating a school's grievance procedures. We may say, it's all very fact specific, but we may say, you have a statute of limitations in here and that's okay, but your statute of limitations is way you know, too short given that people sometimes delay reporting, um, things like that. But yes, OCRs is 180 days. And that's for a parent to report directly to OCR or is that open to employees to reporting direct to OCR as well? It's for anyone who's filing the complaint, yes. Okay. I hope if that does not answer your right. question, Sorry. please put it in the chat um, okay. what clarifications that you need. And we do, I mean, we'll accept, you know, we do get a lot of individuals that will come to OCR longer than 180 days. They will, you know, uh, try to appeal that or explain. We do give people a chance to explain why perhaps they're outside of that 180 days, but I will say it's it's the exception that we would um, allow people to avoid that requirement. Thank you. Um, this was a question I had. I know that there is publicly available data from OCR regarding the discipline statistics mm -hmm. for students with disabilities. Yeah. Um, we've reviewed that a lot in our restraint seclusion work um, yeah. in the county. Is there similar data available regarding harassment and bullying of, of complaints like this? And yeah. I'll let you yes, there part. is. So that's on the same civil, as part of the same civil rights data collection. School districts have to report, um, I don't know if we call it bullying, but harassment data disaggregated by uh, qualities of the person who was harassed and also the basis on which the harassment occurred, if okay. that makes sense. So there is, there is data on, um, you know, individual male students with an IEP who reported being harassed, female students with an IEP who reported being harassed as well as reports of harassment on the basis with a disability. Okay. So that's is the it, same, it's ocrdata.ed.gov. And that's national data, correct? Every every school district in the country reports that. And then we have it, at, so you can look up Fairfax County Public Schools okay. data. You can look up any other school district's data. You can look up for an individual school within Fairfax County Public Schools. I will say, admittedly, it takes us a lot, takes us, to verify they all, I'm not the data person, but to verify and do a lot of work on the data. So it's a little bit removed. It's not the most, you know, we have schools are submitting data every, every two years. So this one is like 17, and, I think. Yeah. And I believe the discipline data is similar in that, correct? Yes. They, it's all the there's same. There's always a delay. Yes. There's um, a delay. Yes. Does that data get reported by state as well? Not familiar enough to know if you could pull it by state. I know you can, there's a district lookup and a school lookup. I'm not sure if there's a state lookup. We also, there are some like national spotlight and data. Restraint seclusion is one. They don't do a national, um, they don't do national data on every, um, every variable that we collect data on within the civil rights data collection. It just depends what, what it is, but. So there may not be for harassment, whereas there, I know there is for restraint and seclusion because that was a an area of focus. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, what should happen if a school fails to investigate complaints of harassment of a student with a disability? I mean, you can, if it's a situation where um, you could, you could, if you've already, if you haven't gone to the school district itself and gone through their gone to the district's 504 Title II coordinator or filed a complaint with the district through um, the district's grievance procedures, you could take that route. If you've done that and feel they haven't, um, they haven't done the investigation during that process, you can go to OCR. Um, and you can even go to OCR if you, it, you can decide the school should have known, should have done its job, uh, and they did it. I'm going to stri going straight to OCR. You don't have to go through the school's grievance procedures first. There may also be, I'm not familiar enough to know the state. In, in a lot of states, there's the state has its own civil rights agency, like 
OCR is at the federal level. So you may also be able to go through the state agency or through this, you know, state department of education, but. Thank you. Um, I believe our next question is what happens if a counselor notices a change in behavior of a student with a disability and does not convene an IEP meeting or notify the parents? That could be could potentially be a, a five oh or sorry a FAPE violation under either either IDEA or five oh four depending on um, under what law the student is receiving services, and particularly if there's, you know, there's been some bullying or harassment, but even even absent that, there's still you know they have an obligation to provide FAPE. So regardless of whether the student was being bullied or harassed. Okay. Um, we have, a, we did have a question come in. Um, I don't believe this is actually in, uh, your wheelhouse to answer. You can correct me if I'm wrong, okay. but is there any, is there a willingness from your organization to ban seclusion nationally? And my understanding is that would require federal law, correct? Yes. That's what OCR has said in the past. Yeah. Um, so Talk to just Congress, to, just <laughs> yes. to speak to that for our, um, for our members here, mm -hmm. um, national PTA has been advocating on that Don Beyer, um, Congressman from one of our local districts actually has introduced a bill, um, in the house of representatives called the keeping all students safe act. Um, we had a chance to talk with him, we being um, leaders from Fairfax County and across Virginia, as part of the national PTA conference in June. Um, so we know that that effort is ongoing. We have not heard any updates as to whether that bill has passed the House or where it is in legislative process. But I do encourage anybody who would like to support that bill to reach out to your senators, reach out to your um, representatives and um, express your support and share with families and friends. The more they hear, the more likely it is to get passed. And I will say, obviously, as you know, that's, you know, restraint and seclusion and, and violations in that area are a priority for the Office for Civil Rights. We have the ongoing investigation with, of Fairfax County Public Schools and other school districts related to this issue. I would also um, put in a, not a plug, but <laughs> urge you to just watch the space for when we release um, the Section 504 and Notice of Proposed Rulemaking in that space. Um, and see uh, if there's amendments there related to restraint and seclusion. And then as you're looking through that, submit public comments on that, because we're interested always in hearing from members of the public when we're issuing proposed regulations. Thank you. We will be sure. on the lookout for that. Yes. Um, do we have, I do not see any other questions in our document. Do we have any other questions from the room? I do know I recalled seeing somebody say they might have a couple of questions. Oops. And I think we got to them. Okay, great. I think, I think. I'm not seeing any other questions okay. coming in. If anybody does have one, please raise your hand or turn on your camera or something. Give me a heads up while I'm wrapping up. Thank you so much, Rachel. Great. This and thank you all. I really appreciate it. And I hope that this was helpful. I'm going to, I'm going to jump off because I have to put my son to bed, but I really, really, really appreciate you inviting me and having me enabling me to present on this important topic. Thank you. I do see one person who turned oh, sure. on her camera, Caroline. Do you have an additional question? Let's see if I can help you unmute. Did that help? Still muted. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. My my daughter was bullied, um, like in she's she has like uh, autism, mm -hmm. and she was bullied on her bus, mm -hmm. and um, she has been skipping school. She's twelve. Like, um. I contacted the school about it. Okay. And um, it took them at least 20 days to get back to me. <clears throat> right. So her grades have been going down. And I'm just. Have asking. they. 
Yeah. I have just, they convened the 504, or I assume she has an IEP. Have they convened the IEP team? Yeah. Finally. No. Right. No. No, they have not. Okay. Um, sounds like there's certainly an, an obligation on their part now. I mean, you've, you've put them on notice. So I would, I mean, you could certainly go to OCR with something like this, but you can admittedly our, our process can take a long time. So I'm always mindful of that. I'm trying to take the, the least, like the, the, you know, I'm not trying to make, I would go, I would go to the district, the 504 coordinator at FCPS. Right. So, yeah. So like, if you're not getting a response from the school, she like she's been she skipped school she she like come back and hide in our house and that I mean that's clearly based on what you're saying this is clearly um you know a violation the school bus counts um this is clearly you know impacting her ability to access her her education and fape and the school has an ob- have obligations that there it doesn't sound like they're meeting at this time right. yeah, like, and I'm sorry resource, about that yeah an additional resource for you Caroline if you have not already you could reach out to your procedural support liaison your PSL if you have requested an IEP meeting and you haven't gotten a response yet mm-hmm. um, that is an additional person for your pyramid that you could reach out to to move that along so I I live in Stafford County oh okay and, okay oh I just I would just so just asking them to do it an additional, I'm sorry, I have. I would request a meeting of the IEP team. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely make that clear that you want to convene. He, your, your child has an IEP, right? Yes. Definitely put in writing that you want a meeting of the IEP team. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I, I mean, Amanda, you may, to- you may have something else to say, but that's, I think that to get that ball rolling, because then it triggers a lot of, under the IDEA, there's a lot of um, built-in timelines that they have to comply with that don't yes. always exist under the harassment regulation side of things. So that will trigger things. And I would definitely put that in writing. Yes. Well, thank you very Absolutely. much, ladies. Sure. Thank you so thank much. You, no problem. Rachel, we had one more question come sure. in that they said they thought they had submitted it, but didn't know where it went. Okay. Do you have time for yeah, one more sure. question? Sure, it's fine. All right, thank you. If a child experiencing bullying, say being hit repeatedly, it seems this would be a per se hostile environment, but receiving this from a fellow special education student, unlikely to be able to form adequate mens rea to be legally liable. Oh, sorry, I'm losing my... Vision. No, it's okay. Um, is it still something that can be adjudicated by the OCR? It seems that many of the examples show fact patterns with magic words, i.e. being called a name or verbally belittled. I guess I'm additionally trying to tease out if as a trigger, there's a difference in the student with a disability being bullied or bullying a student on the basis of her disability. No, if a student with a disability is just hit or something like that, even if it's by another student with a disability, it may be the case that it's not, um, it's it's not, they're not doing it on the basis of that student's disability. So it may be the case that it doesn't rise to the level of like disability harassment, but if that bullying, you know, frequent hitting or anything like that on any basis is interfering with the student's ability to receive FAPE, there, there would be FAPE obligations to respond under 504 or IDEA. So, and you could have, and it, I will, I would say though, also, it doesn't matter if um, a student with disability could harass another student with a disability on the basis of disability. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that the harasser had a disability themselves. Um, obviously, then the school has certain obligations as it relates to the person, the harasser with a disability to see if that was a manifestation of their disability, but that does not relieve their obligation to address the impact on the other student. That makes sense. Um, It's complicated, sorry. (laughs) And I can't really talk to hypotheticals, but okay, thanks. They said perfect and thank you. (laughs) Okay. 
Thank you again so much for You're joining welcome. us tonight. Thank you all. Sure. Thank Bye. You. Have a wonderful night. Um, before we all head off, I just want to give a couple of updates on um, the upcoming events. Um, I also want to say thank you again to Rachel and also to Sherry Belkowitz for arranging for the um, presentation tonight. Um, we really appreciate all that she is doing to put together our events this year. And Kate Volpe and Kate Einhold, thank you for your help on the back end and Michelle Cades as well um, in collecting questions. Um, again, Thursday, there is the National Standards Launch, which we invite you to join the registration I'm putting in the chat right now. Um, and then after that, our next event is Saturday, December 3rd. It's IEP Palooza. We are in person at Annandale High School from 9 a.m. until 12 p.m. There's going to be an IEP, a simulated IEP, and then we're going to have breakout rooms on various aspects of the IEP. For example, writing goals um, and then accommodations um, going down the line um, as though we were going through the IEP um, process. So I invite you all to join us. We, as I said earlier, we will have um, language interpretation available for that event. Um, we are co uh, coordinating it with FCPS. They are a sponsor of the event as well. We are very excited. This is a very ambitious event. And so we hope that you will all come out and join us. Um, the FCCPTA has a general membership meeting on Wednesday, December 7th at 6.30 at the Gatehouse Cafe. And then, as Ali said earlier, the Advisory Committee for Students with Disabilities meets Wednesday, December 14th at 7 p.m. For those going in person, please remember that this is now at Willow Oaks, um, room 1000B. This is not a gatehouse anymore. Um, and you can follow Ali's instructions earlier for submitting pu public comment. And then our next general membership meeting right now is scheduled for Tuesday, January 31st at 7 p.m. And it will be working collaboratively with your school presented by Tracy Lee, the Coordinator of Family Engagement from the Office of Facilities and Family Engagement with Virginia Department of Education. We were supposed to have this presentation last April and she was sick. Um, it was the night of our election. So we are excited to have her back this coming January. Um, if anybody has any questions, the registration link for IUP Palooza was put in the chat. Um, please make note of any language interpretation services you need when you register. If you have any other accommodations, please feel that that needs to be met. Please feel free to email us as well. My email is president at fairfaxcountyseptaorg um, And unless anybody has anything else to add for the good of the order, I think we are good tonight. Seeing none, thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful night.